Welcome to Westside Community Church. This is part three in the message series, On His Way to Jerusalem. Let's join Pastor John Clark as he begins. Today is part three, the last part in this message series, On His Way to Jerusalem. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 17. Uh, We're going to look at verses 11 through 19. And uh, and the exciting thing for me is that... um, uh, not that we're coming to an end with this today, but that I thought we were going to end a different way. Um, I'm always amazed that God is in charge because when you're kind of a control freak like I am, it is hard to imagine that God gets anywhere uh, with me. And then yet to watch him just beautifully mold uh, this passage of scripture and show me what he wants us to hear um, is amazing. I had my own plan And God says, let me take care of your plans. The Bible tells us that he makes our paths straight, even though they're crooked, uh, that he guides us. So may God guide you today, and may you be drawn to him. So Luke 17, verses 11 through 19, I'll read it for you, and, and then we'll jump into it. The Bible says this, it says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into one of the villages, there was ten men who had leprosy who met him. Uh, The Bible says they stood at a distance, and uh, they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. The Bible says when Jesus saw them, he said, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now one of them, and this will be the passage we'll talk about today, the verses we'll talk about, says one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at the feet of Jesus, and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, he said, we're not all ten cleansed? I mean, where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And then I imagine in probably one of the most tender, most beautiful things you could ever imagine, Jesus looks down at this man. He says, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. May we hear those words today in our spirit. Let me pray, and then we'll jump into his word. Would you bow your heads? Father, this is yours. Um, I'm enamored by your word. I'm addicted to it. Um, God, there's a part of me that that just senses that you really want to have full control, and so we give it to you. May your Holy Spirit be the leader of the moment, may may be the leader of our hearts. God, would you communicate to us if if somebody is here today who has been um, at a distance from you, may you draw them in close, and may they come back to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. I, I, before we jump into the, the verse I want to talk about, I, I want to look at, in case I don't get there, okay, I, I, I'm just kind of giving you a side note to where I want to go. The, the, the verse 17 is an interesting verse near the bottom of this passage. He, Jesus asked the question, we're not all ten cleansed, where are the other nine? You've got to understand something. It, it's easy for us to assume that Jesus was ticked off. It'd be easy for us to assume that he was pretty mad. He was like, hey, I got one that came back, but where are the other nine? I mean, almost as though Jesus is saying, I get my dues, right? If I heal you, you better come back and say thank you. But it's not the case. What Jesus is really saying here when he says we're not all ten cleansed, where are the other nine? He wanted wanted us to understand that if you thought the most significant thing in your life was the healing, then you might have missed him. See, he doesn't heal you so you'll be drawn to him. We should be drawn to him because he, he's our God. I mean, he loves us. You know, if Jesus never did a thing for you, if Jesus never answers a prayer for you, may you be drawn to him because he simply is God. See, apart from him, you and I are lost. And, and I think what Jesus was saying was, we're not all ten cleansed. I mean, did, did, didn't, I do, didn't, I, didn't I take care of business? Then how could you not come back and say thank you? You see, I don't know if you're like me, but we were raised as kids to use please and thank yous. Uh, were you raised that way? Did you have manners? Some of you I can tell no. But most of you, yes. 
I mean, we were raised with please and thank yous, right? My mother, uh, if you didn't use the word please, you didn't get anything, okay? She acted as though she was deaf to your command. And if, and if she gave you something, even at the dinner table, it was always great. You'd ask, would you please pass the mashed potatoes? And, and when we got passed to us, my mother would wait and stare at you, and she'd wait for the thank you. And if not, my mother kept a wooden ladle next, next to her. I don't, know what it, I don't know why my mother always had to have a weapon with her, but in our house, maybe it makes sense. But if you didn't, you got the wooden ladle across the knuckles, you know, and you'd be like, what? And she'd hit you again. You'd be like, thank you, may I have another? You know what I mean? You'd have, to, you'd have to remember thank you. Please and thank yous. We've lost that today, haven't we, in our society? Do you notice that? Have you been doing Christmas shopping? Have you been out and about? Have you, have, have you been around people at all? I, I'm amazed. I was in a store, uh, I won't mention the name, but Walmart uh, the other night on Friday. And, uh, and I literally, I, I've told you this before, it's a confession of my soul. If you want me to pick a line to stand in that we'll get out of the store quickly, don't allow me to do it, okay? John Michael and I had agreed that we would go shopping with mother and, and we would get some gifts for our two little nephews. And uh, so we ran into Walmart to get, uh, <laughs> buying guns for a, for a three-year-old, but it makes sense later. Uh, a cowboy, cowboy stuff. He got him hat and rifle and pistols and we got him all sorts of stuff. Nunchucks, I'm sure they use those, Ben. But um, we, got all these, we got all this stuff for him. And, uh, so, and then for the little guy who's a year old, we got him a box of diapers. I mean, you talk about getting ripped off. The three-year-old gets a, gets a cowboy hat, a, a rifle, a pistol, a handcuffs. He gets a badge. He gets a horse that makes sounds on a stick. And the one-year-old gets a box of diapers. And uh, so I had the box of diapers. Y'all might got other stuff. And Mama was going to get distra- distracted. And I'm like, I'm going to go check out. So we ran to the front of Walmart. And we, there's like 85,000 lanes, right? And my whole thing was to choose one. There's the 25 li- items or less one. And I got eight items. We got seven of those. I got a box of diapers. And I get in behind this lady. And I stand in line. We're right there. I mean, this is beautiful. Woman, husband, daughter. I mean, this is like a no-brainer, right? There's lines of people out to the aisles. And I'm like, I'm out! You know, and I'm thinking, what I'll do is I'll text Michelle from the truck, where are you, truck running, you know, because she'll be still inside. Like 15 minutes went, went by. Everybody else is leaving. People had children birthed in line down the ways. And we are still standing in line. This lady wanted to write every check she owned. She wrote checks from different accounts to make up the total of what she was trying to buy. I was going to loan her money. I'm holding on to a box of diapers. All I wanted to do was give it, you know, to somebody. And I, Bop her in the head. But anyways, I just held on to it. My arm basically fell off. I'm serious. People came and went. I watched people come in the door, shop, come back out, stand in line next to us, and leave before we did. What does that have to do with what I was talking about? I feel better. Okay, anyways. Please and thank you. I want to ask, would you please hurry up? Thank you, thank you. Not possible. But everybody has this tension right now, right? And we, we're, we're all about that. But we've lost some of that. And Jesus is not trying to teach you a lesson like your mama did about thank yous. But he wants you to know that if you think the most important part of this story was the miracle of the healing, then you've missed it. He doesn't want you to see the miracle only. He wants you to see him as the man, the Messiah. And I'll talk more about that. So let's do this. Let's jump into it. I don't have a lot of time today. I want to go right to verses 15 and 16. Verse 15 says, One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. I want to look at the first line. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back. You know, uh, a lot of us are kind of trying to figure things out when we read Scripture. I've been teaching you over the years that don't just let stuff slide. Well, can I say to you, there's nothing special about the numerology of this. There was 10, and only one of them came back. 10 lepers are healed of leprosy, but only one comes back. Does that mean that only one out of 10 of us ever say thank you? No, no. I I don't really think there's any magic to the number. I just think Jesus wants you to know that one of them. I mean, just one out of the 10 came back. And, and, he, and he doesn't come back until he saw that he was healed. Remember we talked last week that Jesus says to them, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus didn't do the miracle right off the bat. He didn't just do an amazing uh, bam, and then and, and they were completely healed. He tells them to go and show themselves. And as um, they went, they were healed. Uh, we talked last Sunday about how... Um, how it's a struggle for us at times to understand why God doesn't answer our prayers right away. And here's proof that 
there are times when our healing is delayed. It was as they went. I struggle with the fact that God does not respond in the manner or in the form that I so choose him to do. He seems to take his time. As they went, they were healed. And so when we get here to verse 15, and the Bible says, when he saw that he was healed. Uh, do you ever recognize God's miracles in your life? I mean, I mean, do you see that he did them? Or do you have a sense of entitlement as though because you prayed, God's going to answer? Or because your mama had prayed, God's going to do it? Or because you asked your grandmother to pray that God's got to do it? I mean, somehow we get into a trap of believing if we toss up a three-second prayer, God's got to do it. He owes us something, and we just expect to get it done. I mean, have you gotten to the place where you've lost contact with recognizing what he has done for you. It says, when he saw, he was healed. Listen, have you ever had something bad enough in your life that when it actually came through, you knew it? Or, or, or do we spend most of our life tossing prayers over our shoulder, believing that God's going to answer them because somehow we have connection with him and he owes it to us? Do you realize God owes you absolutely nothing? God owes you nothing. And the fact that he even answers our simplest of prayers is mesmerizing to me. It says when, when he saw that he was healed, I wonder if we look and see that he healed us. I mean, you know, we ask God to bless our food and that we don't have dysentery when we're done. We ought to recognize and see that God is good. What if, what if, what if, uh, what if you prayed and asked God to bless your food and you got food poisoning? Would God still be a good God? Nice. One is convinced. One of them is convinced. This is Deb, of course. You ever had food poisoning? Hard to be thankful to God that you got food poisoning. If you've never been around a porcelain uh, uh, ceramic uh, thingy uh, hanging onto it, uh, projectiling things out of your body, uh, yeah. Just getting a word picture here. It says when he saw that he was healed. It says that he came back. Can I say to you that it's necessary for you and I to come back? Make sure you come back to God and thank him for everything. Make sure God gets it. But, but more than that, when I read this, it says one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back. I began to think about in my own life, how often am I, how often am I willing to come back to moments in my past and thank God for his healing? I mean, do you ever come back to a moment and realize, wow, God has done a miracle there. I need to thank him again. I, my wife and I, back in 93 through 96, went through some tough financial times. We lived paycheck to paycheck. We had some tough moments uh, years ago. And, 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 and when you have an extended period of time, when you live really tight, when financially you don't have a lot of money and everything matters, it's amazing how that will mark your life. Well, that's been like 15 years ago, 15, 18 years ago. But from time to time, the two of us will find ourselves standing in our kitchen. We'll be talking about a, a purchase that we're going to make, or we'll be talking about good in groceries, or what we're going to do when we go on a vacation. And my wife will still do this, and maybe it's just the wife it triggers with most. But she'll still say, John, do you remember when we didn't have money like this to even go shopping? I'm like, yeah, I, I don't ever forget that, honey. And, and we'll be thankful because we come back to the place we realize that God had fixed that. God had answered a prayer. It isn't God didn't answer because we make more money. It isn't because God answered it uh, because we've gotten smarter. What happened was God has answered it. And over the years, we've never let it go. We've never forgotten how good God has been. We come back to that place. My son, who plays college soccer, he's a junior, just got defensive player of the year again for three years in a row, which is amazing to think about. This is a boy that at eight years old, had lumber collapse on top of him. His face had 32 facial fractures. His foot was fractured. Blood coming from his ear. I remember riding in the back of the ambulance as we rushed to the hospital. And I didn't know if my son would make it. He's 21 years old now. And, and just an amazing athlete, amazing young man. I know that there's some brain damage though. But he's an amazing young man. 
And I thank God, and, and when, he, when, he, when he called home and told us about getting Defensive Player of the Year again, and, and absolutely, that's an amazing feat to do three years in a row. And, and, and by the way, he never played soccer in high school. He was a basketball player. He plays it in college, and, and it's just amazing. And I always think about it, every time he kicks the ball with that foot, the fractures in that foot from that accident. And I'm thankful that God has provided for him. I come back to those moments. I, I see him as a 21-year-old man, but I come back to the moment when he was eight years old. I want to thank God. Do you ever go back to the moments and thank God for the things that he's done for you. November 4th of last year, 2010, I'd fallen down a hill and ruptured the patella tendon in this knee. Uh, the surgery uh, had to be taken uh, place six days later. I, I was in a leg brace for up to three months, physical therapy for six months. That I don't walk with a limp is amazing. Uh, I am shorter on one side. Uh, that's the heel implant that you see now. Anyway, so, um, no, I don't have heels. Went through a lot of therapy just to be able to walk. And uh, so we called the place where I had fallen down this hill, wounded knee. Um, and uh, my wife said to me, you are never allowed to go back there again. And I said, absolutely, honey, you can trust me. I will never do that again. And so on, uh, on November 4th of this year, I'm going to stand over here, and when I tell this story, on November 4th of this year, I called Pastor Lyle. I said, hey, you want to go for a walk? And he says, yeah. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, just, just going to go for a walk. And he goes, isn't today like the one-year anniversary of when you fell down the hill? And I go, absolutely. So we go back to the hill, get out of the truck. And he goes, should we be doing this? And I said, should we be asking ourselves if we should be doing this? We're grown men. Can't we just walk down a hill? He goes, the last time you walked down the hill, you fell. I said, hold my hand. <laughs> and we walked down that hill and we walked back up that hill just to prove that God is a good God and that he heals. I'll be honest, I was so thankful as I was coming back up the hill. Pastor Lyle was crying at the bottom of the hill. He couldn't get footing. And I was walking up the hill. <laughs> Remember, he had a ACL surgery last year too. So two of your pastors are lame, okay? Uh, and the other one might be dead. But anyway, so here's the... Uh, Love Pastor Rick. I love him. That's who I was referring to, by the way, if you didn't know. So, uh, I'm not worried about him here in the message, so bad ears. Anyway, so um, <laughs> on the way back up the hill, I couldn't help but just come back to that moment thinking it was a year ago that I, I'd come down this hill different than when I was going back up. And when I came back up, I was dragging myself back up the hill on my own. And uh, God provided, and I was so thankful. I wonder if that's part of what God wants to teach you. Do you ever come back to the moments and just thank God for what the miracle he performed in your life? Or are we so rude and ignorant and arrogant to believe that God owed it to us somehow? Folks, can I challenge you today, if you don't hear anything else, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta remember that God, if he answers even the simplest of prayer for the meal that you consume, or if he fixes your marriage, or restores your finances, or brings a child home, that you and I ought to come back to him and just praise him, praise him, praise him. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you would even notice somebody like me. You understand that God waits to answer your prayers, but how much more he waits to see if you'll be thankful. We're not that far removed from mama's lessons of please and thank yous. The Bible says that he, he came back praising God in a loud voice. Now, can I say to you, when I read that, uh, I, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little mesmerized by praising God in a loud voice. Culturally, you need to understand, the use of a loud voice in this culture is not acceptable, but only in certain situations. I mean, I, I, there, there seems to be a lot of yelling that we see. I mean, we, if you watch the news at all, you're familiar with the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, and people will chant out prayers, and there's a lot of loud loudness. But if you read your Bible and you understand culturally, screaming, loud voices were not acceptable. This was a, this was a passive, uh, passive society. And the only time you elevated your voice was if something was serious. This is serious. He sees he's healed, and he comes back praising God in a loud voice. He wants everybody to know, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. Do you know what I find amazing about this? Doesn't that sound familiar to you? Does that ring a bell with anybody? Praising God in a loud voice. Do you remember the last time? Do you remember, do you remember how we met this guy, this guy with leprosy? Look at verses 12 and 13. As Jesus was going into a village, he met 10 men who had leprosy, uh, and they stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. 
Do you not see the correlation in a culture where it was not really acceptable to do a lot of yelling and screaming? They yelled out to him, Jesus, Master, have pity on us, because they stood at a distance. They had to raise their voice because they were at a distance from him. But then when he sees that he's healed, he can't help but to raise his voice and come back to God and, and, and in a loud voice praise him. I wonder how many of us are willing to, to call out to God, listen to me, uh, you're going to be uncomfortable for the next 30 seconds, and then I'll make you laugh and you'll be fine for the next 30 seconds, but I wonder how many of us are more comfortable with raising our voice to God and calling out for help me, help me. God, if you don't do something, nothing else is going to change. God, if you don't fix my marriage, I don't know what I'm going to do. you got no problem with raising your voice and asking God for help. But when was the last time you raised your voice to the top of your lungs to thank him for what he's done for you? Isn't it ironic We'll raise our voices when we need help. But rarely do you find any of us raising our voices to say thank you. Listen, I'm not trying to hurt you today because I feel it inside my own spirit. I got to imagine that, that the disciples who stood nearby had to have been humbled as this man runs back to Jesus. He kneels in front of Jesus and he thanks him. And I wonder if one of the disciples just thought to himself, I didn't even do that today. I didn't even thank him today. And this guy has run back. Can I say to you that he comes back to Jesus? Remember, they're going to show themselves to the priest because if they show themselves to the priest and the priest says you're healed, they're back into society. I wonder how many of us are looking for the approval of man when we should be coming back for and applauding the Messiah. You see, the nine of them went to get the approval from the priest that they could come back into society. They were healed. But this one decides that, forget that. I don't need the approval of man. I want to applaud the Messiah, the one who has healed me and done a miracle. How often do you rush back to God and thank him? Mm. I, I, I got to move on. He says he threw himself at the feet of Jesus. Uh, you now, get this, understand, he threw himself. I wish I could. My knee is, is more than a year healed, but I'm not about to throw myself on the ground. I thought about it, though, for a moment, but I'm not going to. Um, he throws himself at the feet of Jesus. Do you understand the humility it takes? imagine this, he has had leprosy. I read for you the medical description last week, how horrific this disease was. Did he have it one day? Did he have it one month? Did he have it for a year? Did he have it for 10 years? How long did he have the leprosy? I don't think it matters. If you've got leprosy, you're a dead man. Jesus heals him of his leprosy. He has spent his life to this point, planning on dying, and now he knows he's gonna live. And he comes back and he throws himself at the feet of Jesus. I mean, you almost, you almost can hear the dust come up from his body as he lands. You almost can feel and taste the passion in the moment when it says he threw himself at the feet of Jesus. I got no other choice but to thank you, Jesus. I don't care. I will humble myself. What a great God. And he puts himself at the feet of Jesus. But more than that, listen, watch, listen, I'm almost done. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm captivated by this moment. As this man throws himself at the feet of Jesus, I wonder if he reaches out with a hand. The Bible doesn't tell us, and so this is my own conjecture, but I wonder if he reaches out with a hand and he just touches the feet of Jesus. Now for you and I, some of the most disgusting things we possess are our feet. You ever have a, somebody who has bad, nasty looking feet and they wear flip flops all the time? Do you know what I'm saying? You know, like, like you're like, you should not bring those out in public at all. And they're like, the flip flops? No, just the feet alone. God designed socks for your feet and your feet only. I mean, feet are not some of the best things we have to offer the best features. In this society, wearing sandals and how dusty and dirty they would be, it says he threw himself at the feet of Jesus. I love the picture here because I imagine he reaches out at some point to touch Jesus. And because he's prostrate before him, the closest thing to touch is his feet. 
But listen, when you haven't been allowed to touch anyone for the period of time that you've had leprosy, just to touch his feet, just to touch someone, just, just to know that I can do this now. I'm healed. I'll take feet any day of the week. The Bible says Jesus is the lifter of our head. I've got to imagine that Jesus touched him and lifts his head up. Because the Bible says that Jesus says, rise and go, your faith is made you. At some point, I've got to imagine there was a return touch. See, I wonder how many of us have been disfigured by something in our life. That's what leprosy does. It disfigures us. I wonder how many of us have been disfigured. And it's been a long time since we've been emotionally touched or that we've been able to be spiritually touched. I wonder how long it's been since Jesus has gotten to that place in you. It says that he thanked him, that, that he threw himself at the feet of Jesus and he thanked him. I, I don't have time to do it. It's about 10 minutes to, and I got about four minutes left here. Back in September, I, I'd done a message series at the core on Wednesday nights. It's online, and I talked about gratitude, and I talked about thanking Jesus, and about, about how, we, how we forget and how we play down the fact that we ought to be thankful. And he thanked him. It's an, it seems so simple, and thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Is that enough to say thank you? But here's what happens is we lose contact again with reality. We forget what to be thankful for. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 says that God determined the times set for you and the places where you should live. Let me say that again. God determined the times set for you. The time you're living in right now, the 2000s, God determined that for you because he knew you couldn't survive any other time. Okay, and he and more than that, and, and he decided where you should live. He knew you couldn't make it in Las Vegas. Okay, so we put you here in Traverse City. Stop traveling there. Okay. <laughs> Do you know why God does that? Because He knows that we couldn't make it. If you were, if, if, think about it. If you were born in the sixth century. You couldn't make it. Some of you can't stand living in the trailer you got, but if you were born in the 6th century, you've been living in a cave today. How would you like to have come out today from a cave? <laughs> Just making sure you're with me. God knows. He set the times for us. You know, you and I ought to be thankful that this is the time and the place where we live. Thank you, Deb. There, there comes a time when, when we just take it for granted that God somehow owed us to be at this time. Do you realize if you were born in the 1800s and you got a hangnail and it got infected, there was no antibiotics? Do you know if you got a hangnail and it got infected in the 1800s, you know what they would have done for you? Nothing. And if you cried loud enough, they would have then done something. Do you know what they would have done for you? They would have cut your hand off. Do you know if you get a hangnail today and you whine enough, I'll take you to urgent care. We'll just walk in there. We'll sit for an hour and wait and complain about the medical treatment that we're going to get, the antibiotics, the fact that a professional doctor is going to treat you even though if he doesn't speak English, but you know that you'll be cared for. We ought to be thankful that we live in this. Listen, if you were born in the 16th century, you would have had a goat pulling you in a cart. You got a car today. I don't care if your car broke down or not. You got a car today out in the parking lot. And when my car breaks down, I own other cars. I get to walk around. Not that I own a dealership, but I get to walk around and choose which vehicle I'll drive today. Listen, there was a day and a time when you didn't have that. Thank God we have this. We somehow lost perspective. We ought to be thankful to God for what he does. And he thanked him for the healing. I wonder how we've taken things for granted. I, I, I I wonder how often we've misplaced our sense of gratitude. God, thank you that you have put us here and now and that you heal us. He thanked him. I'll be honest, I do a terrible job of being thankful. I mean, there's times when I really want to recognize that God has been so good. But then I read this and realize that I wonder if I would have been among the nine who needed and wanted the approval of men more than I wanted to come back and thank Jesus. And you see, I'm talking about myself because it helps you to do your own therapy. I could point the fingers out at you. 
but I let the Holy Spirit do that. I mean, when was the last time you really thanked God for what he's done for you today? And do you often come back to a place and thank him for what he did yesterday? Andy, would you guys come this morning? As a worship team comes this morning, I want to look at the last line. It says, and he was a Samaritan. I I don't want this to slide by. I I don't want you to miss those last few words. It seems like an add-on, and he was a Samaritan. Is it a derogatory statement? No, not so much as the writer Luke wants you to know that this guy didn't belong. It would have been unusual in this day and time for him to get a miracle. If Jesus being the Messiah, he was sent for the Jewish people, why in the world would he be doing a miracle for a Samaritan? Remember, Jews are on the inside and Gentiles are on the outside of God's plan. So they thought. Ironically, you'll find in the Bible over and over again where Jesus would find those who were on the outside and invite them in. It says, and he was a Samaritan. He was a Gentile. He was in the, on the outside. He came back. Is that to say the other nine were Jewish? We don't know. We just know this one was a Samaritan. He had been disfigured by his leprosy. And he had been discounted by his heritage. He did not live among the in crowd. But now he was in the presence of Jesus. I wonder if that's not a description of us. We don't seem to be on the inside. We seem to be on the out. Would God really answer my prayer if I just asked him to do a miracle? Can, does God still do that today for people like us, Samaritans, Gentiles? The answer is yes. If you want to get out of debt today or get out of depression, he will answer that prayer for you. He will do those miracles, not so you will be healed, as much as that you'll know that he is the healer. Do you got leprosy? Are you struggling with that? Or are you struggling with the loss of a loved one? He wants to do the miracle, not so you'll know him as the miracle man, but as the Messiah, the one who came to ransom you from your sins. Is it your pride that you're struggling with today? Then give that to him. Or are you in need of provision? He is the God who does miracles. He was on his way to Jerusalem, not just to die for humanity, but to say that he loves humanity. And if a God loved us that much, then how can we not say thank you? How can we not rise to our feet and say, Jesus, you are worthy of so much more praise. If you never answer another prayer beyond this moment, I will praise you. I will throw myself at your feet. You are a good God. I was on the outside and now you invite me in. I was broken and now you make me whole. I was missing and now I have a place. God, you are a good God. There ought to be within us praise that rises and says thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you that you cared enough. And more than anything else, that he loved us enough to go to Jerusalem to die, to provide for us a way out of hell. That we would have a place called heaven. He builds a bridge. And we ought to thank him. We ought to thank. There ought to be within us a resonating power. That Jesus, thank you for saving my soul. That you made available to me your grace and mercy. Oh God, that I would come back to the moment of my salvation and say thank you. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, all you have to do is call out to him. Confess your sins. Invite him into your heart as your Lord and Savior. Now and follow him. But folks, we cannot, we cannot not thank him. Would you stand to your feet this morning as we get ready to close? It's a new song we're going to sing. But watch the power of the expression of the words. Don't leave here today without thanking him. Thank him for what he's done today, what he did yesterday. On his way to Jerusalem, he was thinking of you so that one day you might come back to him and thank him for what he did. Andy, would you lead us this morning? Thank you. 
Thanks for joining us at Westside Community Church. We hope to see you Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. or our Sunday evening service at 7 p.m.